Welcome everyone. Uh, is my mic on? Yeah. Uh, welcome everyone to the Persuasive Tech Lab um, and to this first panel uh, called Calm Technology. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to, that you're all here. So um, thanks for coming. And uh, I want to keep it very short because we're a bit already late and I don't want to steal time from our uh, great speakers. So I'm going to go straight into introducing uh, our moderator, Annette Decker. Uh, she is an assistant professor of media studies, archival and information studies at the University of Amsterdam, a visiting professor and co-director of the Center for the Study of the Networked Image at London South Bank University. She is an independent researcher and curator, and previously she was researcher digital preservation at Tate London, tutor at Pietzwart Institute, fellow at the New Institute, and she initiated uh, .net. <laughs> <laughs> together with Annette Wolfsberger. In 2009, uh, they coordinate artists in residences and set up strategic and sustainable collaborations with national and international art organizations. And she also worked as a web curator for SCORE, mm -hmm. Foundation for Art and the Public Domain, that unfortunately closed in 2012. And she was program manager at Virtual Platform, head of exhibition, education, and artist in residence at the Netherlands Media Art Institute. Uh, so please, a warm welcome to Annette Dekker. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, I'm very happy to be here. And I have to say, um, the start of all this huge list of uh, my lose was actually impact. It was my first job in the cultural sector after I graduated. So uh, I have really, really warm memories. And I'm really happy to be here still, in a way. So I'll be uh, moderating the discussion. Uh, to a bit of a uh, planning issue, perhaps, is that we'll have three presentations. And we'll go one after the other, so uh, we won't do questions after the presentations uh, individually. We'll do them all at once in a sort of panel where everyone will be sitting down here. So please hold on to your questions. If you had like really, really urgent questions in between, which are very easy to answer, then uh, we can make an exception. But for the more um, deep and uh, thoughtful questions, please uh, hang on to them. So I will briefly introduce each uh, speaker before they start. And first of all, I'd like to welcome Olia Lialina. She's uh, originally from Moscow, but has been living for a long time already in Germany, where she's also teaching at the Mertz Academy in Stuttgart. And yeah, to me at least, she's one of the most best known, and I think to many of you as well, uh, net artists. She started already in the early 90s and has become really famous as, um, as a gift cool, um, but also as a real explorer of how to preserve, um, for example, geocities, how to deal with online uh, museums in Art Telepolitica, which she originated as well in the end of the 90s. And she's also been quite a regular, I think, in, in Holland and also at Impact Festival. So uh, without further ado, I'd really like to welcome her. Um, maybe you can already um, position yourself while I give you like a little glimpse of what she's gonna talk about. I mean, the whole uh, Calm Technology panel that we are at now asks at the end of the, of the little brief intro, who's being served? And I think that's a really interesting question. I think Olia will also give us more insight in how interfaces are serving or are not serving us at all. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annette. I was told that it's a very powerful mic and you can hear me well, right? So I don't have to go closer. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to share this uh, morning with people who will talk after me, who make such a great and important um, work. And uh, just a uh, short sentence, I'm here today, not right now. I'm not uh, today as a GIF model, not as a net artist, and not also uh, as a um, person who preserves early web, but uh, um, someone, uh, the, my third uh, instance, the, um, the person who teaches 
new media design and interface design and uh, who writes about this topic and who tries to resist um, the user experience paradigm that took over everything. I am um, uh, really pleased that the title of the festival has the word interface in it because um, the word is disappearing together with two other very important words, which are computer and users. So computers become technology, interface experience, and user become uh, people. And uh, this is like the user experience UX paradigm, what I'm talking about. There can be some um, other <coughs> fields or some other uh, notions where you can look how the meaning of the words changes, but today we will mostly talk about um, this line. It's how from human-computer interaction field to, uh, to user experience, uh, the we were forced, I mean we users and we designers and um, we uh, theoreticians were forced to use words that are technology, experience, and people, not to uh, say what, not to, uh, to or to, let's say, to be alienated from computer, from interfaces, and for, from our essential role as users. Um, this uh, process started to um, accelerate this renaming started to accelerate about 2008-2009 with the race uh, of uh, user experience of the um, UX uh, field that is of course older but that when it started to uh, become more popular and uh, more wise, uh, widely used. And uh, in fact, but there was a moment that it was really, um, let's say, um, uh, became established, this new vocabulary. And uh, that's why I have here this. We believe technology is at its very best when it's invisible. When you're conscious only of what you're doing, not the device you're doing it with. An iPad is the perfect expression of that idea. It's just this magical pane of glass that can become anything you want it to be. And that's why so many people in so many different places are using it for so many different things. It's a more personal experience with technology than people have ever had. I will stop it here that you remember the last phrase. It's the most personal experience with technology people had ever had. Yeah, all three words are there and uh, they would never be used the word um, computer or use or something else. Um, and it was 2011. Uh, and, to, um, and let's say it's not just, uh, it was a marketing and uh, ideological campaign of uh, uh, so-called IT uh, or tech giants. It's a joint effort of uh, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Google to use the words that uh, make computer users uh, less powerful. And uh, just to <clears throat> make a connection, it was the commercial Apple commercial from 2011, and in 2007 with the new iPad, it became like it finally worked their plan to alienate. Let's see it here. What you doing on your computer? What's a computer? Yeah, I always... Uh, uh, wish and I saw it that uh, it will not end, uh, that the next shot will be not a commercial of i, of the new version of iPad, but that the lady would explain to her what the computer is, and that uh, it is a computer is a programmable system that is programmed by somebody else and can be potentially programmed by you. But uh, it didn't happen, and. Uh, um, let's say I'm not, uh, this was just an introduction, and I will not talk today about how users became people, though it's the most interesting for me, and this is the poster that is in, the, in Facebook headquarters. Um, I will also not so much talk about uh, technology, though I, I think I have to make this remark because we're in com technology. Uh, panel, and uh, one should say that the word 
technology used instead of computer or programmable systems. In fact, means that it is, uh, it is calm, it is pacifying, and uh, it is sedating, the meaning of this word. So actually, you don't have to say calm technology, you just say technology instead of computer. And uh, I, unfortunately, I make a lot of enemies by going to people who use the word technology, and uh, these are friends who then are uh, unhappy because uh, I say, no, it's computer that uh, should stay there. This is a, a bag from Rhizome, one of my, uh, Rhizome Org, one of the best organizations for computer art, but they made this cheesy bag and I had to rename it. Yeah, and what should I say? Now I'm at the event that is, uh, has art talks and technology in this title, and I really suggest to think about uh, another word to use here because, yeah, we are artists and we can only talk and I think at least we should uh, find the right words to uh, to negotiate and it can, can then make our art talks more, um, more meaningful. But let's go to the experience. I will show to you now some examples of how experience um, replaced in the messages that um, um, different services are sending to us, how it replaced the interface. And it sounds like, uh, in the beginning, it sound, sounded like really nonsense, but step by step, we got used to it and we know what it means. And look, for example, here the first screen. This experience is navigated by scrolling with your mouse. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah? And it means it's not experience, it's a website. But who wants to design a website? You want to design experience. Loading your experience. Again, it is a, it is a web page. Another example from Skype. Just a moment, we are improving your Skype experience. Yeah, it is an update. It is an update in the interface. Um, we will use this to personalize your account experience. In this case, it is per personalization of account. The word experience doesn't mean anything, but it has to be added. And this is, uh, so you see that uh, the industry has problems but expressing itself without using this word. Security level experience also. It is just a security. Here's interest, you can easily Add this website to your home screen to have instant access and browse faster with an app-like experience. It means, here it means interface. It will be an app mm, interface, like reduce interface. We have um, launched and are actively testing the new login experience. I think I don't, you are getting to them. <laughs> One of the favorite Amazon leadership principles is customer Obsession, when we launched Lombarda, we focused on giving developers a secure serverless experience. So now even developers are um, confronted with the experience, though they are the last people who need it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, to let you know about upcoming change to the billing console experience. So yeah, just a change in the interface. Um, this is uh, something that uh, has another meaning here. Uh, very often designers now, developers, they, when it comes to conversational user interfaces, yeah, when you don't really uh, have buttons, I don't have graphic user interface, and like how to make it, they don't want to talk about interface, though it is still interface and it has to be designed. But then it is, of course, it's, uh, it's very nice to say to this experience, and this is um, introduction of, um, McDonald's new system to uh, register to apply for the job and this after being after beginning the experience via Alexa yeah so it's now your action but it is uh, yeah it is uh, it is meant here that uh, uh, you are that it will be very easy and it will be pleasant yeah so this meaning is also added to this and uh, this is one of the newest examples what I have, and here that's, uh, it's a wonderful uh, new font face that was introduced, but here is a real 
um, wildness and madness. So it's monospaced form shipped from Microsoft and provides a fresh experience for command line experiences and code editors. So command line, of course, it's command line is command line. It's an interface. Yeah. But here you see that this uh, the person knows how to write probably and makes everything great and uh, beautiful but uh, and but still the two words experiences in the in the sentence which is a bad writing style but uh, you you are not allowed or you don't want in, in in no case to to use the word interface here um, this um, the next <clears throat> is maybe um, mm, yeah, <laughs> because if there's a word experience, there is more chance you will be more positive, even about the ads. <clears throat> this one, uh, I will finish my collection with this. It's maybe the least spectacular, but I choose it there to, to bridge to the next third. Um, because uh, here you see it says sign in for the full experience. And this is something for what, uh, what accompanies, what experience this meaning, this idea that it's something, it's full, it's big, it's bigger than interface, it's bigger th than everything. It's uh, what you, um, uh, it is um, like everything. This, uh, this image I took, uh, I just searched for, um, for experience. Um, and if you search for experience design, and if you search for it, you will also find a lot of diagrams, a lot of drawings, a lot of illustrations that would show to you what a beautiful and uh, holistic world is it. Uh, so it's always something like it's more than just something. And that's why so many people, maybe also among you, renamed yourself from interface designers to experience designers, because it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is more promising not just more trendy. But in fact, what the truth about um, experience design and uh, experiences comes from there, that uh, it is, um, in fact, it is not about making something bigger and uh, more full or more interesting. It's about making very, <clears throat> asking very pragmatic questions and actually narrowing everything what you can do and given to your products that uh, are um, <clears throat> that are specialized and that are very precise so it's a very pragmatic approach so this comes from the um, this is I, this i took from the um, this uh, illustration from the book by uh, german uh, superstar of um, experience designed from Mark uh, um, Hasenzal from the book that is a, uh, this, uh, manual for user experience design and uh, where he explains, and this is what everybody knows who studied it, that uh, uh, experience is um, uh, user uh, experience design principle is not just to, start to ask what and how, but to ask why. Yeah? So not uh, what uh, the person wants to do, what user wants to do to make, a to, to make a phone call, but as they say, why? So why, and this why means whom I want to call. Do I want to make a phone call to my colleagues, to my beloved one, to my children, to somebody I hate? And for this then to create applications exactly. Yeah? Uh, so to <laughs> that so-called also user-centered design. So to ask everything from the user and then to um, give products that would be um, exactly tailored for this. So it is this why in user, in, in, in experience design. It's not a philosophical question. It's a very pragmatic question. And it's not really why, but it's what exactly and who exactly. Yeah, so don't be... Um, illusioned about it. Uh, the <clears throat> I would like to then to say that um, at this moment, because we're talking about the words, and uh, very quickly, I think I introduced you this trouble about experience, but there is another word, maybe you noticed it, it's on the rise right now, and the word is affordance. It's also nothing new, 
um, by itself, but uh, <clears throat> it is uh, entering a vocabulary of uh, professionals and also of other fields very intensively right now. Affordance um, means uh, it's sort of, I would say that this is a, um, how it's called, it's something what really, um, it's a great supporter, a so-called gray eminence of experience design affordance because it's about giving a very uh, precise uh, clues to the users of what they can do with this or that software. And um, <clears throat> there is a, the term, to make it short, it was um, taken, uh, it was uh, borrowed by Don Norman from, uh, from uh, um, ecological field of ecological psychology. It's a uh, term by Gibson that was applying that he applied for the environment in general around. It has nothing had never to do something with computers. And then the interesting or crazy thing about this term is that Don Norman started to use it for the uh, for interfaces. Uh, how, what affordance should be in the interfaces. And in fact, he, uh, it was, it sounded very reasonable, like person should understand immediately that where is the button, where is the field form, and, and so on. Um, but then it also appeared <coughs> that the word, originally the word affordance in ecological psychology meant uh, something else, and uh, it is, uh, it is there, it is independent. It's not about making things easier. Uh, for people, so in general, and then Don Norman said, "Okay, I am. I mean, perceived affordance, and it is made only all this even more uh, complicated and uh, obscure. And then now we are living in a situation that where if you go into in design uh, blogs and so on, people talk about false negative." Um, and uh, all illustrative photo affordances. So it's, it repeats the uh, fate of, um, uh, it repeats the fate, the destiny of the word experience. So it just starts to mean um, nothing. But at the same time, there is also <coughs> a danger uh, in it. Um, and the danger is um, that uh, it is there are two dangers two interesting topics maybe to discuss later. One is that uh, <clears throat> and the word affordance left uh, the uh, human computer interaction or interface design circles and started to be used by media theoreticians. And so people discuss affordances of the media. And this is a dangerous thing because there are no affordances and we uh, shouldn't do it. It's uh, sort of, it, it's a, again, pacifying. Uh, we should not be asking what are the affordances of the media. There are other questions uh, that can uh, bring us deeper. And another thing that we are entering from, we are living uh, very fast the world of uh, human uh, computer interaction and entering the world of human robot interaction. And uh, affordances get really crazy appearances there, because people talk about affordances, affordances of uh, anthropomorphic robots, and it leads to the crazy creatures. And uh, this other, this example is uh, the one, and this another one, it is from my, uh, the work of my students uh, who were dealing with the concept of fulfilling anthropomorphic form to what it can uh, lead uh, in the in the future. I can't now go into the details because my time is actually absolutely over. But if you allow to me one more minute, am I allowed? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Am I? Yes. yes. OK. I would like to, <laughs> because somebody is looking very, uh, very angry at me. <laughs> uh, let me uh, uh, say some words that, uh, another word that is um, uh, coming back right now is a beautiful and again extremely important word for interface design and the word is forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness that came, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, took into account and developed um, um, in the, 
and together with the, with the undo function. And uh, one can say that, uh, uh, yeah, it is just another more beautiful world for the undo. And unfortunately, we are losing undo as the function in general because of the experience design, because of the because we're not doing anything, because applications are designed in a way that you get such a direct path to everything that you don't even notice that there is no undo anymore. But then uh, <clears throat> the thing is that, uh, like, last month, it's really a new thing, I started to notice that the word forgiveness start, start to come back in the conversation, uh, but without undo. <laughs> and this is a, um, a dangerous uh, uh, thing, because uh, now it, is, it, it changed its meaning. It's a very important concept. But now, at this moment, undo means performing designed function without the need for corrective measures from the user. So it's about knowing everything about the user. Forgiveness starts to mean knowing everything about the user or providing interfaces where you uh, can't go back or uh, yeah, such, making such things that you are, um, you are again a person who just have to enjoy what is given to you. Okay, there was something more, but I will stop here, and I think we can discuss in the end what happens to get with out of what comes out of mess with all these words. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alia. Uh, I'm sure indeed there's plenty of questions to be asked. Um, but I want to pose you one question. In the meantime, I'll ask actually Christina to already start setting up her presentation to perhaps catch up on some time lost. I, I really like your idea of messiness. And I think it's one of the, the, the best ways of met metaphors, but also practices, actually, to think about how to use computers. Do you, do you see a future of messiness? in computers. You, uh, you mean you are using it as a positive, like as a, like as a stupid network, which is like not central. Yeah, but I, the mess should be on our side. <laughs> yeah. So we should be controllers of mess. Thank you very much. We'll come back, we'll come back to that, actually. I think it's a really interesting topic. So I'll briefly introduce now our second speaker, Christina. She's a researcher and designer working in the Netherlands, originally from Romania. Uh, she's currently based in Rotterdam, where she was one of the co-founders of this artist-run collective space, Varia. And uh, she has a real interest in infrafunctional automation. I'm curious about that one. Situated software and digital collections. Her practice very much consists of artistic research, investigation into intimate bureaucracy of knowledge organization and sharing systems. And I think that's also one of the things that she'll be talking about today, which is the project Plotting Data, which she's currently doing together with designer and researcher Ruben van der Ven, in which they look at data sets, data sets as collections of large image sets in which indeed they are read by the machine. So I'm curious to hear more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here along these fantastic speakers and thank you for the great introduction in it. Um, so in preparation for this talk I went through all of the references that uh, Ruben and I have been putting together in relation to our project and what really struck me um, like just I think yesterday or two days ago before uh, coming here is that uh, all this time the two of these references had had a lot of overlaps uh, and I think putting them in conversation can be perhaps a nice way to start the presentation. So the first one is um, an example from James C. Scott's book called Sing Like a State where he describes the city of Chicago which you also see uh, in the satellite image. Uh, and he describes it from a bird's eye view and what that means. Um, so the line, these lines upon lines arranged neatly into rectangles that make up the street blocks, which you also can quite very clearly see from the image. Um, the flattening superimposition of spatial order and rational control has not necessarily a relationship to the 
uh, order of life as it is experienced by its residents. So according to him, the tidy geometry of the city planning makes the city legible to municipal and state authorities. Uh, but not necessarily to the residents themselves. In fact, he argues that the standardization benefits the surveyor, the planner, um, and uh, the speculative um, uh, real estate planner. Well, the real estate speculator. Um, because with such a geometry, the cost of land can be much more easily calculated as at, a, at a glance. Um, the second observation I would like to make uh, bring forward is taken from Catherine Dignazio's article called uh, What does feminist data visualization look like? where she gives a really poignant example of how different perspectives on the same um, data can lead to new interpretations. So she talks about the Detroit Geographical Expedition and Institute project uh, from the 1960s which brought together academic geographers and some of the inner city youth of Detroit. And th this was led by Gwendolyn Warren, at then 18, well, uh, the, yeah, the group of activists, was, uh, who is a, an, was at the time an 18-year-old black female community activist. And the goal of this research was to bring together academic geographers with folk geographers, as they are mentioned in the paper, uh, in order to conjure up what they call oddness maps. So maps of how things are and maps of how things ought to be. Um, and the map that you see here on the screen um, was the title of, of it was given by Warren, as well as she has been leading the research that led to it. And it addresses the issue of children from black community of Detroit being run over by cars from white affluent suburbs on their way to the downtown area. And it casts a very different light over the, uh, I mean, otherwise conventional looking uh, data visualization that we have in front of us. Perhaps uh, you've noticed that both in both of these examples, the Detroit uh, example and the, the Chicago one, they have a similar ur urban planning, but I mean, for me, it was a complete uh, surprise to put these two together, which I've used in different presentations and to see like how much these intersect, yeah, how these intersections of the lines can be interpreted in many different ways. And by putting them side by side, I hope that the importance of considering who holds the bird's eye view and how they are affected by the order uh, that has been imposed on them because becomes uh, obvious. And this brings me to the topic of this talk, which is data sets, because uh, yeah, another means of structuring and ordering. And with the rise of machine learning algorithms, um, you always have to have one person talking about machine learning algorithms, and now it's me. Uh, we're hearing a lot more about them and we have in, than we have in previous decades, but that doesn't mean that they were not as important before. They've just moved from being a peripheric topic to being quite central in debates around data bias, especially in, within this field. So machine learning algorithms learn from data sets, and this is not to say that they alone contribute to the worldview that they then project uh, onto its subjects, because the statistical assumptions that are embedded within the model are equally important. But uh, uh, a data set, especially if it's meant for supervised machine learning algorithms, uh, which seems to be the most used type in decision making, uh, em does embed a certain worldview. It determines what gets to count as data and what doesn't. And it is an act of description or definition of a type of subject that it creates itself, a cut or a choice in, in how to represent it. Um, the failures that we see in media at the moment, when the progressively infrastructural quality of these algorithms become visible, uh, are, and they are really becoming more and more embedded into the public infrastructure, and especially in the Netherlands, this, there is a lot of uh, current discussion going on about including uh, them in, in like, things like um, uh, tracking whether social tra so social security recipients are committing fraud um, in police and intelligence services, but also in the legal system. In fact, there was a recent discussion last year in March 2029, March 29, uh, on, on this subject specifically. Um, so this leads me to... Um, uh, the topic of uh, gray media, and usually, usually I describe data sets as gray media, a term that has been used by Matthew Fuller to talk about the phenomenon where pervasive administrative tools which enact power become invisibilized, thus falling out of sight. 
Um, and I think that their apparent neutrality as well as the quality of seamlessness become both their most powerful and dangerous assets. And this is, he has actually a whole uh, section that is dedicated just to describing data sets. Um, I won't read it because I'm worried about the time. <laughs> Um, read it out loud. But um, I, I mean, this was also in response to the topic of the panel, comp technology, because I do wonder, in a sense, if gray media could be a subset of the topic uh, of comp technology, which was coined in 1995. Uh, and it's described as that which informs but doesn't demand or focus or attention. And they give as an example of calm technology a video conference that by comparison to a telephone conference enables us to attune to nuances of body posture and facial expression that would otherwise be inaccessible. Um, but however, with current pervasive computing, I think that the previously mentioned nuances that they refer to, uh, these facial expressions are tracked, they're rated and used to determine access to services and facilities. So it's quite a shift. Uh, between 1995 and now, <laughs> but also not. <laughs> um, so this leads me to plotting data, uh, the project that I'm currently doing with Ruben van de Ven, an artist and programmer, uh, which uh, is inquiring how making a data set and determining the parameters for its vocabulary can be an artistic and activist tool. So the intention is to counter the grayness of the data sets and to create interfaces to explore existing data sets that are outspoken in their take on the data. And we started this research on data sets because we both had been working with machine learning algorithms in our own practice, coming from each coming from a different angle. So Ruben is inter interrogating the adoption and cementation of pseudoscience classification theories uh, into machine learning algorithms. And I came from an interest in how communities work with these algorithms and what potential they hold. And slowly we noticed how the vocabulary of the data set determined the, like, how the code would speak. Um, both of us have a background in design, among other things. So we started also seeing data sets in relation to publishing. A collection put together with intentionality with authors, is put together with intentionality and authors. Um, and it is directed to a very specific crowd, whether that is most of the time developers or uh, um, policy makers. Um, or academics. Uh, in his research on databases, Francis Hunger, who is an artist that we've interviewed for the purpose of our project, he identifies the authorship in its in the data set and database as uh, his superstructure, which meaning the, the elements that led to its pre-configuration, pre the, the administrators, the data scientists, the data the managers, um, include interfaces, the interface designers or politicians. And in this sense, data sets, which are a different subject of study, um, have also many authors, but I would also include the annotators, the cleaners, the data collectors, all in addition to that. Um, okay, so how do we move away from misleading emphasis on a technical form of literary toward, literacy towards an infrastructural perception of data sets? And there are, of course, multiple ways to do this. Um, we, we we prefer to think we prefer to go towards this this direction where we think of the, of data sets as an intermediate stage rather than a starting point so to look at how it came to be and i think that the artist Mimi Onoha which i think has shown work at impact before in the previous years uh, she gave a brilliant example which shows the difference it makes in having different entities collect the data and the different tactics that they use. So in 2012, the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Program registered 5,796 hate crimes, as opposed to the Department of Justice's Bureau of Statistics that came up with 2,900, uh, no, 293,800 reports. And that is over 50 times as much as the first case. And I think that the difference in numbers can be explained through the way that the data was collected, uh, because in the first, well, in the first situation, law enforcement agencies across the country voluntarily reported cases. In the second situation, the Bureau of Statistics distributed a survey um, in people's homes, so uh, it called the National Crime Victimization Survey. Um, and this this difference really, I think, also led to the, the yeah gathering a very different amount of data. 
<clears throat> so how would we go about focusing on gestures of interpretation instead of those of extraction and capture? Um, we decided to work with uh, workshops and interfaces. Um, and I would like to already start uh, introducing to some of, not, not data uh, interfaces that we have made, but for example, um, a lot of existing data sets use interfaces in their creation. And I think it, they're quite interesting to uh, look at and observe because they already make very clear uh, the, the, the type of decisions that go into making such a data set. And for example, this is um, an extract from the paper accompanying um, the COCO data sets, Common Objects in Context by Microsoft. And you see like the type of work that um, Mechanical Turk workers would do, for example, uh, labeling the categories, spotting an, an instance where the object appears, uh, or uh, segmenting uh, an instance of making, yeah, drawing around it, uh, verifying that other people have done a good job, um, and crowd labeling. But these are just a few uh, extracts from the paper. Um, most of the time, there's not not so many traces of, uh, of, of on Mechanical Turk anymore. Um, so, but at the same time, there's, uh, they also provide interfaces for exploring the data sets themselves. Um, and for example, the COCO data set does this as well. It has 91 categories that are grouped into 11 uh, super categories, they're called. And the first time I encountered this, I did notice that there is quite some interesting, uh, I wouldn't, yeah, it, it, it does have a bit of bias if you look at it because uh, multiple, but for example, in the sports category, it's uh, like two of the, of the um, 10 are actually related to uh, baseball. <laughs> and I think this is only played in a specific part of the world. Um, and specifically, if you look at the food as well, I mean, the selection of pizza, hot dog, cake. I mean, it sounds like my dream <laughs> food selection, but I don't think it can apply to a lot of people. And I became quite interested to see, like, why are there more uh, categories um, showing domestic objects and objects from mainly within the house? Um, and who made the selection? So surely enough, when looking into it further, it turned out that they had combined multiple sources. One is the Pascal Voc data set, uh, vocabulary itself, then a subset of 1,200 most frequently used words. But the most interesting one <laughs> was that they asked uh, children aged four to eight to select um, names of objects that they see in indoor and outdoor, outdoor environments. And I think with this in mind, the, the food category makes a lot more sense. <laughs> But I mean, there are already certain stories that are embedded within within the making of the data set and within navigating the data set. So how to bring this forward? And with, these ex with this example in mind, we decided to make, we make our own in data set interfaces that work towards uh, familiarity. With these processes through storytelling and dramaturgy, uh, we've done multiple workshops until now. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's maybe also useful. Ah. Yeah, this is in case. This is an extract from the, the, the paper that accompanies the data set, uh, where they, in case you were doubting. <laughs> um, but I think the term by Johanna Drucker, performative materiality, makes a lot of sense within this context uh, at, because it expands upon um, yeah, what it means to use um, this material. Um, because it suggests that something can be understood in terms of what it does and how it works with machinic, systemic, and cultural domains. Um, and I, I decided not to talk too much about the, the workshops that we do because each time they are very different and each one comes with its own introduction and presentation, so that can take up a lot of time. Uh, but I would like to speak about one of them, which was... Um, on the Enron dataset, 
perhaps some of you are familiar with this corpus. It was We chose it because it's one of the most influential corpuses in the machine learning field, especially in the natural language processing, and it is only used there. Um, but uh, it comes from this company called Enron that uh, went bankrupt in 2001 after they were accused of fraud. And so um, the emails of certain employees were made public and then used as a, turned into a data set. So um, anyone currently can just download this collection and go through people's quite private and personal emails. And considering the, the way that the data is now structured, that uh, you get like hundreds of folders and each folder is the last name of a person, it, it can feel a little bit strange to be, to be going through uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, someone's communication, which they assumed would be private. Uh, but uh, we did. <laughs> um, but we tried. We try. Uh, we're still trying now. I mean, this is why this is more of a uh, this is more of a prototype that we've been using only in workshops and uh, only to sort of uh, allow people to navigate what what kind of content there is in the data set. But we try, for example, to um, remove the names in the emails and to still as much as we can. Uh, generate some anonymity, although this is not yet public because we'd still like uh, to uh, try to remove uh, like uh, instances where people's names and last names appear. Um, anyway, so this was part of the one of the workshops that we did already twice, um, where we create different queries um, that ideally put like bring together different narratives um, the color in the background is actually connected to the the time at which the emails were sent so this is we're trying to bring back into the interface certain elements that disappear from the actual data set collection so the the bodily elements like finding out um, if people like uh, searching for moments when people were describing their feelings of tiredness but also looking at emails that were sent after 3 a.m. who are these people who were still working um, and it be and w the more we, we started digging into it the more we realized uh, that um, it became it's a bit like a time capsule like you can you can start retracing certain moments that were really important within uh, at least um, American history <laughs> Uh, but for example, the moment when uh, George W. Bush, w uh, the junior, was elected is embedded in some of these emails. Like you see people starting to communicate about what's happening and sending each other, yeah, quite personal um, emails. And from there on, I mean, the the reason why also we didn't want the interface to be too. Uh, yeah, that uh, to to still maintain its its sort of simplicity is that this isn't for us not the main work, uh, and we're more interested actually to to create um, uh, like spaces of interaction within the the website the sorry the workshop, and I just see that I have one more minute, so I'm gonna I want to leave with this, which is uh, we work together with the artists. Uh, and performer Amy Pickles, who started putting together uh, a, a small script based on some of the queries that we made for her, um, which we then ended up enacting with some of the participants from the Das uh, Theatre School in Amsterdam. And I mean, this is just to say that an interface can be many things. It's, of course, we were making both web interfaces, but we were also trying to play with what it could mean to use your body as an interface to to uh, engage with the material of these uh, otherwise quite gray media and to make them, to maybe increase the saturation a little bit. Um. <laughs> Thanks very much, Christina. Can, you, can I ask you uh, one short question? Um, I'm not sure if this is really going to be really short, actually. Uh, <laughs> you, you talk a lot about storytelling and narrative. In, in what way do you think that the computer is now also becoming the storyteller itself? 
<laughs> we can also leave this for, for later. <laughs> Maybe we leave this for I'm gonna Okay, ponder about that one. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to introduce you now to our last speaker, David uh, Benke. He's a designer researcher from Paris and now currently living and working in London. He is a PhD candidate at the Royal College of Art on a scholarship from Microsoft Research Cambridge. So that's going to be an interesting one. Because uh, his research actually investigates algorithmic prediction through critical design practice with a specific focus on diagrams and the methods informed by media archaeology. He has also a link to Holland, where he did his BA in graphic design and typography at the KABK in The Hague. Today he will talk about his project, Architectures of Choice, in, in, in which he kind of attempts to map recommendation systems, and particularly face, or not Facebook, sorry, YouTube. And he's particularly interested in traces. And what that means, uh, I'm looking forward to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Impact and especially to uh, Marluz for the invitation. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk to you about my attempts to uh, map YouTube. I'm going to spoil it right away. It's uh, mostly failed. Uh, and I have no big... Um, big reveal for you about how YouTube works. Um, and this is part of my point, actually. I'm just going to present some, um, some experiments uh, as examples of a kind of practice that just tries to grapple with these systems, um, to probe them, uh, and, and to reflect on, on what and uh, also how we might get to know about these systems, basically. Um, this work was large, uh, largely done with, um, through a collaboration with Betty Marenko, who's a design theorist, uh, reader at Central St. Martins uh, in London as well. Um, so all the, if there are any good ideas here, she's to be credited with them. So according to uh, its engineers, the YouTube recommendation system, which is uh, one of the largest neural networks uh, currently in operation, uh, is a bit like a funnel. Right? So it's, it, first it selects um, some candidates out of the massive uh, YouTube catalog, uh, and then it, it orders these according to um, what is thought to be user preference uh, to maximize um, for uh, watch time. Right? So the, what is most likely to keep this person watching? Uh, that's the measure of, uh, of engagement. And so for critics, this, uh, this personalization um, that maximizes for watch time is kind of a, just an illusion of, of choice, right? Um, there is basically um, a really uh, deeply positivist um, premise to this recommendation that treats uh, user, user preference as this kind of independent, you know, stable reality that we can just observe and kind of neutrally, uh, objectively predict. Right. It turns out um, you can't really measure something without changing it. So uh, under cover of making predictions, uh, what's really happening is, is a production, a prescription uh, of categories and of uh, identities. Um, and so the, the funnel is starting to look a bit more bleak. Um, anthropologist Nick Siever characterizes these uh, recommendation systems as traps. Uh, and he talks in particular about the role of traces uh, in a move from the, the industry, uh, from trying to predict uh, explicit ratings, so typically like you know, on a five-star scale, how would you, you, know, how would you rate this, um, to using traces, which are basically the implicit data, uh, the interaction logs uh, of how the users you know, kind of interact with the, with the platform. So, uh, where did they click? Did they finish the video? Uh, did they have any other tabs or whatever? You know, like all these kinds of implicit uh, data that are much more abundant because you can just keep tracking more and more things. Uh, but also, they are thought to be more accurate, right? The, th this is thought to be a window into what people really like. And this is a classic of this uh, positivist uh, position, which you hear a lot um, repeated a lot um, also about Facebook. You know, Facebook supposedly knows you better than you know yourself. This is a kind of classic. Um, so I want to try and do justice to Nick Siever's argument. It actually, it's actually much more um, nuanced and interesting than a, a simple binary. 
between control and freedom. So I want you to hold on to this thought. I'll come back to it at the end. Um, but for now, just a quick summary. We have two views of the recommendation system as a funnel. Uh, one is this kind of distiller of personalized content, uh, and the other one is a kind of trap, a kind of you know, B trap device that the user kind of walks uh, or watches into. And in practice, this entrapment has um, some negative effects that you know, has been, have been discussed in many places. Uh, notably, they tend to, to encourage the, the recommendation of increasingly extreme uh, versions of the same arguments. They've played uh, a big role in propagating uh, conspiracy theories, like uh, Flat Earth, for example, has been proven to be um, largely propagated through YouTube. There are, of course, much bigger systems and much bigger ideologies that are at play here that should be considered, but um, YouTube uh, definitely played it, its part in it. I just noticed this campaign uh, from Mozilla uh, that's currently running, uh, pushing people to document their worst YouTube rabbit holes uh, in a hope to kind of pressure uh, YouTube into fixing uh, its algorithm. Why they do this with a Google form, I have to say, is like completely beyond me, but um, that's maybe another question. And so these logics uh, of entrapment are, are mobilized as part of um, kind of specific agendas, right? And, uh, and we know that um, the conservatives and the far right have been uh, particularly successful at mobilizing this, um, these systems. And so faced with all this, there is a... Um, a kind of tempting proposition, uh, especially I would say since the, the 2016 US election, uh, to make these algorithmic systems transparent, right? to reveal their inner workings uh, and to correct the bias. We hear about this a lot. Uh, and this is um, what the projects like uh, Argo Transparency um, propose to do. It's not limited to just the map I showed, but this is like a bigger project with uh, studies and online tools and stuff. Um, and the claim is still the same. It's like providing a window into the engine. Um, if only we could see inside the black box, you know, we could kind of fix this stuff. And especially in this Guardian coverage, uh, we can see that the positivist premise is basically unchallenged. Uh, there is still a stable objective reality. It's just being distorted, you know, by the algorithm. We're not getting to the real truth. Uh, we just need to recalibrate. And this is uh, often the case in these kinds of redemptive moves, right? Uh, Guillaume Chasselot, who's um, behind this algo transparency, is an ex-Google engineer. Uh, and many of the other kind of more vocal critics of uh, algorithmic capture uh, were first uh, kind of active participants in setting these systems up. So they, they, they don't challenge the kind of uh, foundations of it, but they just... Um, want to reverse the, the maximizing or like the optimization function. Uh, people like uh, Tristan Harris or Nair Eyal uh, come to mind here as well. And so Mike Anani and uh, Kate Crawford propose that this whole looking in business is not, is not enough and actually misguided on, the, on many levels. Uh, and the, the image of looking under the hood and into the inner workings and stuff into the black box is not going to work. The, the box does not contain all the complexity and all the problems, right? Instead, they argue that we should look across, you know, uh, how algorithmic systems uh, help to enact agendas, how they are entangled with other systems, with ideologies, uh, economic, po political motivations, and so on and, and so forth. Uh, in, in the words of um, Johanna Drucker, again, um, it's about relations, not revelations. And so with all this in mind, uh, I still kind of set out to map YouTube. Um, I was not aiming to kind of do better or to like solve any of these uh, problems. Uh, but again, just to kind of grapple this stuff through practice. Right? And so I designed some kind of probes uh, which use a, a headless browser, which means they, they deal with the web pages, but right? not with the API. Just they, they load up the actual YouTube web pages and interact with that. Um, and, and they try to kind of map uh, the recommendations on different, um, different levels. Uh, so first I was trying to map everything, so get all the recommendations, follow all the links and all the recommendations again, and so on. Uh, that didn't work. Um, 
then I tried to carve one path, so still map all the recommendations, but then only pick one at random, and then just one at random. So these are very tentative, right? First, they start from um, the YouTube homepage. A lot of the studies uh, of YouTube out there, because there, there are quite a few, uh, take search terms as a starting point. And I chose to start from the homepage. Uh, and then this picking videos at random, you know, could seem like um, random. Um, there, are, there are, again, studies that take a much more sophisticated approach here. Um, but for me, the point was um, to kind of get samples, you know, to start just engaging with this stuff and seeing what, um, what I could come up with. Uh, and so I basically started to feel my way around um, this, this thing uh, and attempted to map everything, which pretty much uh, crashed after the second round. So this is the, the one that's trying to map everything, and this is just trying to do two levels. Uh, but I also um, started to feel some kind of fault lines, uh, some edges emerging. So if I dialed back the second round and just pick one video instead of trying to do all the recommendations, uh, you started to see kind of structure uh, emerging. Um, I broke uh, the layout engine of uh, Mermaid.js, which is like a diagram uh, generator, uh, which was basically not suited uh, at all to my purposes. Um, and I ended up with a, a bunch of visualizations um, that were, um, you know, starting to, to map, but um, also I wasn't really happy with it, and uh, I struggled to escape the kind of, you know, as I was saying, the kind of positivist uh, view, uh, and I basically realized how much of this stuff is embedded in the very tools of data visualization, you know, through default options, layouts, and things like that. And so this is when we combine this with the earlier um, thinking we had done with uh, Betty Marenko about speculative diagrams uh, and submitted uh, our abstract with these uh, recommendations to a conference called Research Through Design, who was actually here uh, last March in Delft. Um, and just as a kind of speculative move, uh, just to see what happened, there was a big gap between our kind of critical theoretical position and the, and the stuff, but you know, just try it. And so our doubts uh, were put into words by a, ref uh, a reviewer from the, the conference that kind of pushed us to focus uh, on individual um, past rather than try to map everything. You know? And it's kind of aligned well with uh, um, instincts or like you know, things I already wanted to try uh, to do. So we were like, I challenged the authors. OK, challenge accepted. Um, and basically, um, the key shift for us was in the notion of traces, right? So I mentioned traces as a kind of data source, um, implicit interaction logs, et cetera. But traces are also um, what Carlo, historian Carlo Ginsberg um, calls sources for conjectural knowledge. This is the type of knowledge that's used by diviners, uh, trackers, or hunters uh, when they imagine the appearance of an animal they have never seen from the traces, right? So it's this kind of um, leap. Uh, from a trace to, to uh, this kind of speculation. Uh, and then, so this helped us to really own the kind of subjectivity and situated nature of what we we're doing. Uh, and it allowed for kind of chance and unpredictability to enter into our outcome. And so in our case, the traces were kind of actively produced. You know, we're not finding anything in the mud here. We're just like actively producing this stuff. So maybe this ha also has to do with with things like uh, dye tracing when you release you know, colored agents into uh, water streams to kind of imagine um, caves that are otherwise uh, unreachable. And so what happened was um, make, we started making a much more deliberate use of um, data visualization tools, uh, basically purpose building uh, our own instruments that um, focused on producing or on visualizing these uh, traces. Um, and this was the print version for our paper, which was uh, small kind of strings uh, of videos. We have a, so the, that paper is available if you want to, to read it. Um, but I think um, the project really came into its own in the, um, in the animated uh, version, which basically um, plays back uh, sequences um, 
of recommendations that um, we captured uh, online. So this is, for example, um, a string of 13,742 uh, YouTube recommendations um, here stuck in one of the many um, toy children video rabbit holes that um, I have identified. Um, and so I think this kind of, to me, kind of um, aligns with um, Ginsburg's version of traces because it kind of encourages through this kind of contemplative way of looking at YouTube uh, only through the titles and the, the relations. Uh, it encourages conjectures uh, as each video comes up as to like what might be the link between uh, that and the previous ones. You know, it's kind of uh, this um, contemplative screensaver that encourages you to imagine uh, the algorithm that you will never see. And so here I'm showing you a video, but um, there is actually a, a way to, to look at this, which also speaks to the, the kind of streaming um, technology. Uh, so if you're familiar with the Beaker browser, you can go to um, uh, this uh, address and uh, turn on uh, live reloading, and you should get uh, the playback from that trace um, synced to your computer in a super kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, really lightweight about two kilobytes per frame um, way. If you're not familiar with the Beaker browser and the DAT protocol, I encourage you to check it out. It's, it's great. It's like BitTorrent, but for websites. And so I've recently expanded on this project in the kind of volume two uh, of Architectures of Choice, um, where I ran a workshop for design students at uh, NC in Paris. Uh, so they each had to choose a platform, uh, develop a method to gather the data, and then a way to visualize, to kind of make a cartography of, of recommendations for that platforms. So this was interesting um, to me because these were designers who were largely not coders. Um, and so they really had to, to deliberately find ways of engaging uh, with, this, with this subject and with these platforms in a kind of material way. Um, and kind of find their, feel their own way around. So we had uh, maps of wigs on AliExpress, nice overlaps between like industrial design and kind of logis logistic systems and recommendations. Uh, we had kind of conspiracist views on supermarkets, um, supermarket recommendations, and an undercover um, infiltration of a small company's uh, LinkedIn network which was documented across the week. And so the problem, uh, one problem we, we had to think about during that workshop, and especially because it wasn't a coding, a coding workshop, is like how do you collect this data uh, from the platform, right? And increasingly, uh, you know, all the APIs and access um, is being uh, shut down. Um, and you know, you could question what kind of access it was in the first place. Um, and I think this is really well put by uh, Robin James in her recent review of the book uh, Spotify Teardown. How does someone, how, how does one study someone who doesn't want to be studied, right? And I think, um, so the post-API method term, I think, uh, comes from uh, this um, digital methods initiative, which is currently uh, setting up some work around this theme. Um, and so I think the really important thing here is to, you know, how does one study someone? Um, coming back to the co conjectural knowledge thing, it's important not to reduce that to what we can know, so just the access of the data, right? Uh, I think there is a, a key thing to, to remind ourselves about how we know about these things and to really challenge the digital positivism I was talking about in the very way that we, ga we gaze back uh, towards these systems. Uh, so to include and embrace maybe speculation and conjecture, um, one way to summarize this as a critical position would be, uh, you know, you're not going to tell us, okay, fine, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to imagine the worst things about you or maybe make fun of you or whatever, but, you know, take this kind of active uh, conjecture as a, as a mode of um, critical practice. Um, this isn't without its dangers, of course. Conjecture doesn't, re doesn't necessarily mean good. Um, but, you know, there is still, I think, an important line here. And so these are all fancy words, but in practice, this, um, 
actually mean very mundane and kind of tedious things. So this is me preparing for the workshop, digging into uh, Amazon product pages uh, source code to get the name out of the, for the element where the product title is. So, you know, this is all kind of very um, material and mundane. And so to conclude, I want to come back to Traps and Nick Seaver's um, argument. And so, as I was saying, this isn't just about a binary between control and freedom uh, and a practice that can somehow reveal or um, escape from traps. Uh, as much as there is capture or enclosure, this type of activity or practice is also hosted by algorithmic traps. There are literally the conditions for its existence in the first place. And so there is a weird uh, symbiosis almost here uh, from creative practice. I think there is a real um, kind of material attention to be directed uh, at the minute details of these traps. Instead of embarking on a, or framing this as some kind of crusade, um, I think uh, there might be some key things in you know, learning to, to live in traps and to subvert them. And so I will leave you with the last line from um, Nick Seaver's paper, which is probably the most uh, hopeful things I've ever read about traps. The question to ask of traps may not be how to escape from them, but rather how to recapture them and turn them to new ends in the service of new worlds. Thank you. Can I ask Olivia and Christina to come and join me with David as well on this uh, lovely bench? And we have around 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes for discussion. Um, I'll take the opportunity, having here the mic, uh, to pose the first question. Um, I think all of your talks were really interesting indeed about looking into the underlying and perhaps implicit or more, I would say, explicit politics in a way about the interface, data sets, and recommendation systems. So my question is really, so how can we keep our calm? How can we actually make this into a productive dialogue in a situation where we're kind of trapped? <laughs> what, what do you mean with we? Are the users. <laughs> I'm not sure every people is a user or every, yeah, that I, want, I don't want to go that so, far, but the users at least. From. Mm -hmm. And come, you mean <laughs> not intervening or <laughs> continuing to work in our direction or what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, keeping a calm is indeed more for me, it's like, well, how can we indeed turn the table perhaps? How can we start influencing? the systems that are put upon us? Well, yeah, I mean, I think this is something I kind of saw in each of the talks is like, um, you know, Oya talks about a certain agency and, you know, if you talk about computers, then you talk about programming and you talk about who does the programming and maybe it's you doing the programming, um, taking hold of data sets and thinking about the agency and producing these data sets and maybe how, you know, changing what they're accessed. Uh, and I think in particularly in Nick Seaver's point at the end, you know, there is a kind of calm coming from um, that sort of reclaiming of a kind of agency, if that makes sense. Uh, however, kind of, um, you know, speculative or um, even uh, kind of pointless this might seem in the, f in the frame of, you know, these kinds of grand narratives of First of all, what the algorithms are supposed to do, and then how we're supposed to turn them right or like correct them. Uh, I think it's really important to reclaim agency in whatever mode, uh, and then maybe more, more importantly, in modes that aren't part of this kind of instrumental mm -hmm. list view. Maybe. I'm al I'm also wondering whether calm is the sentiment that we need for this. <laughs> Because I, I, one thing that struck me about looking more into like what content technology actually is, is also invisibilizing the tools that we use and invisibilizing the politics behind them um, and staying within this um, uh, uh, 
like uh, not moving, basically being immobile in that sense. And I'm not saying I'm not argumenting for panic as the mode of of reaction, but perhaps um, like for me, like dealing with these issues together with others is a a sense of brings a sense of calm. But at the same time, I think that the urgency still needs to be quite very much at the forefront of why we're doing things and how we're doing them in a way that is uh, considerate as well. Um, uh, and doesn't, of course, you don't want to lose yourself in the, this. Uh, it's not a race either. Yeah. Hmm. Can I also use the, the this proximity to microphone <laughs> and to, um, to continue? But I really have a question I, I would like to ask. Uh, David and maybe also you, Christina, as well. You addressed it in the end of your talk, but I was thinking it about from the beginning, like this. How uh, with uh, you addressed it with um, app? Um, how to uh, um, not app? Um, API, a post API research. You said or oh, how it's called, and I was. But I was um, thinking, like asking, how do I wonder? How do you? What do you think? Or how do you feel? about this situation, about your situation as a researcher, that, uh, in fact, you are maybe just some blocks away in your studio from the Google headquarter. Yeah, you could go and uh, you could go and ask uh, developers what is the algorithm, yeah? <laughs> or it's not a critique of your work. I know that you can't, but <laughs> how do you feel about this? Uh, situation that you have to reverse engineer, you have to uh, investigate, but in fact it could be, we could be in the world that uh, this would be published, the algorithm, or am I oversimplifying? That's the thing, I'm not sure that it could be published. Or they have published, you know, the, the very first image in my talk is a, it's a couple years old now, but it is a, you know, paper, technical paper about the neural network in the YouTube um, mm -hmm. system. Uh, and, you know, this is probably the, the simplest image in that paper. It's full of much more fancy looking things. Um, but what's the algorithm? You know, like in... But somebody wrote you, it. So. Somebody wrote it, but it's, I don't think all of its um, workings and especially all of its effect can be um, seen in it in the code. Do you know, it's like, then you have to include all of the user data mm -hmm. that it's using, all of the video mm -hmm. data. So we're already talking about a huge uh, algorithm. And then you have to talk about YouTube's uh, business plan, okay. um, all of that. So I, I don't think there is such an easy route of just going to the headquarters and having all the answers. And I think, at least to me, this kind of um, method of really just you know loading up the web page and going from there was interesting because um, you start sampling the kind of you start sampling the system from the other direction. I mean, I'm not, you know, it, it has huge flaws. Uh, you know, it's probably not um, acceptable on a kind of scientific <laughs> p-value level, but I think, I do think as a, as a practice, it was, it was interesting to take that route, or at least there is some, you know, some avenue there that's um, maybe interesting to, to think about. Since we don't have that much time, I really like to hear your questions as well. There's someone walking around with this lovely interface and microphone thing, and I will throw it up, and there's questions up there already. Great. <laughs> you have to catch well there. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I think I saw a pattern in the three presentations in kind of dealing with the appearance of neutrality. Um, whether it's of the technological systems behind. So whether it's through words that sanitize what they do, like experience or a database, or whether it's because they give the illusion of choice, in the case of David. And it seems that a challenge is how to, um, kind of like how to desanitize that, how to um, take 
of this illusion of that the technology or the computer or the algorithm is neutral. I was wondering if you have views, the three of you, on um, the role of the design here, the role of the design of the data set, the interface, the, the YouTube itself, in first creating that illusion of neutrality and also its potential to get rid of that illusion. Does that make sense? Totally, I can ask with also a very uh, simple answer um, that I, uh, and with statement that I um, <clears throat> try to bring across as often as possible that uh, there is a profession of uh, uh, interface designer and a lot of uh, that is uh, in incredibly important, I think, and this maybe should be people that they should be educated and educated uh, <laughs> and educated again and again, uh, because on the level of interfaces, there's so many decisions are made. And sometimes they're on purpose, sometimes without purpose, but they still affect. You know, the metaphors chosen, idioms are thrown away, something is um, hidden or something else is uh, um, emphasized, and uh, uh, again, it can be even without any purpose, but it has an uh, immense influence on, on everything. And uh, so, uh, and quite often it is made by uh, people who maybe only studied graphic design, and then it is a very dangerous <laughs> thing, yeah, because we just have, a, we get, get a, uh, only, a, um, how it's called, Oberfläche. Um, Surface level, S uh, superficial. No, the surface, only the surface, yeah. yeah. And it becomes a border that you can't cross. Well, all you said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, it's completely right. Um, just acknowledging that any... So in the case of YouTube, you know, how are you going to order the catalog? How are you going to order, like, whatever, trillions of videos? That's always going to be a choice. Um, so I think acknowledging that there is no such thing as in you know as a neutral or objective ordering of of this content is you know maybe in my case the answer to your question. And if you're doing an interface to it, you're making choices, um, and you're imposing you know prescribing these choices onto whoever's using it. Um, Mm -hmm. But so if if this interface, like you say, by graphic designers is creating this uh, illusion of that is neutral, uh, do you have ideas who else to include or how, how to do it differently? No. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's also a matter of, it's a good question, like how, how to maybe uh, also extend a little bit the practice of graphic and web design so that it's not always the designer that uh, ends up making the final decisions, but rather that it becomes, um, or to experiment more with practices of collective decision making um, and collective design, I would say, um, could be a way forward. And maybe to step, to fight against this tendency for designers to step back. Well, again, there's multiples, multiple, <laughs> multiple, um, trends of, in regards to how designers related their work, but maybe to play with the relationships uh, that uh, like the people who design have towards the material that they work with that can go outside of this realm of everything has to be optimized and productive. I mean, for example, you know, just speaking back, sorry, the no is a bit abrupt, but um, so for example, in the case of YouTube, you know, this, this not, we're not just talking about the interface, it's the, for example, the optimizing function, what's ordering those uh, things in your, what to watch next. You know, so this is also part of the, um, you know, neutral or like, you know, objective ordering of what's supposed to be interesting to you. So if you start including these things and what functions um, are at play behind that interface, maybe that's, somewhere where we could start to um, challenge what we're maximizing for. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. I've, I've got another question all the way up there, so if you can throw, yeah. perhaps see why it lands. Excellent, very good. 
I, I keep it short. Isn't the problem that uh, these companies, they don't want to change? It's, it's all about making money for them. They don't want to reveal their uh, metadata. And uh, my friend next door to me says that's half the problem. If the metadata is wrong, then the recommendation is wrong. But more profoundly, they don't want to reveal their algorithms because that's their commercial uh, under, underpinning. They don't want to uh, change the way the algorithms work because that's what drives the engagement, no matter how destructive it is for the society at large. Isn't that the problem? Yep. Maybe, maybe just to, to briefly indeed answer that indeed. It's like, okay, well, if that is the case indeed, then um, can't we ask of those companies that are so powerful to also come up with a certain ethics? But, and where's the incentive, though? I mean, the population at From large the population aren't interested. That use it. Politicians aren't interested. It's, it's well, just, we it's, are. We, we are, but we're yeah. a small. Uh, well, a small, quite a large a small, amount of people. Um, I don't know if we're large enough. <laughs> yeah, but for this, uh, that's why. What to start to demand something like to <laughs> to demand uh, uh, the, your user rights? You have to call yourself a user. Yeah, this what I, because uh, and uh, uh, otherwise it is. Mm, calming, just that we all are people, we all want better world and better algorithms, it doesn't bring to anything. <laughs> and, and also maybe to mention the tech coalitions, which actually have achieved quite a lot in the, in the, last, in the last few months. Uh, but of course this has its own problematics, because you can't always rely on uh, uh, yeah, people who can pick and choose which actions they, 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 they choose to, to revolt against. But I think that's, uh, yeah, worker solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but one of the first um, algorithmic systems uh, was developed in um, to, not to recommend, but to order um, uh, seats on flights. Uh, on planes. I think it was American Airlines, but I, I'm probably wrong. Um, and the, the system was found to um, to say, you know, put all the American Airlines to the top in all the kind of travel agencies were pushed to, uh, you know, um, book on American Airlines. And everyone was like, what? What is this? This is not neutral. Da, da, da. And the, the guy, um, who developed this was like, of course, why, like, why, where would be the incentive for me to develop a really high tech system like this if I couldn't bias it in my favor? Uh, I can give you the exact reference where it's actually much better, but um, of course, but I think this is the key thing, you know. Um, I think terms, especially terms like artificial intelligence, you know, kind of cloud all this, these um, logics and kind of boring, mundane, hey, I'm just get building this really complicated way to get what I want. Uh, that's all hidden when we talk about artificial intelligence between, behind, like, you know, imaginaries of sci-fi and stuff. But I think, you know, you're completely right. This is just hyper um, human intentions uh, in politics. I'm afraid I still see hands, uh, but I also see a stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> and at the moment, that's kind of convincing more for me. <laughs> However, though, I do think we should definitely continue uh, the discussion outside, and we'll hear more stories. And I would just advise you to stop keeping calm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Christina, Julia, and David.